Hello listeners everywhere! Welcome to the Archive of Audio Antiquities, a voyage into the vault of wonders on the wireless. In a moment, Simon Exton and Ken Moss will be here to speak to you. Hello everyone and a very warm welcome back to the Archive of Audio Antiquities. I'm Ken Moss. I'm Simon Exton. And this time we are listening to the BBC Radio 4 Miss Marple adaptation of Murder at the Vicarage. My nephew, who is really quite a successful novelist, is in the habit of comparing life at St Mary Mead to the scum on a pond. But as I once pointed out to him, if you were to smear that scum on a slide and examine it under a microscope, you would find it teeming with life of a quite unexpected kind. Take the vicarage, for example. A haven of righteousness and tranquillity, you might think. But you would be surprised. This was a BBC Radio adaptation of the first full-length Miss Marple story starring June Whitfield in the title character and it was broadcast in five episodes between the 26th and 30th of December 1993. The series would go on to adapt all 12 of the full-length Miss Marple stories. The final one they did was the final one that was published, Sleeping Murder, on the 8th of December 2001. And following that, in September 2015, there were three short stories that were broadcast in the Miss Marple's Final Cases series, The Tape Measure Murder, The Case of the Perfect Maid, and Sanctuary. They were all directed by Enid Williams and adapted by Michael Batewell. Oh, and Michael Bakewell, I know that you won't be remotely interested, but he did the very highly acclaimed Lord of the Rings stuff, among many other things. So I'm a big fan of his adaptations. This one I went into with a bit of a raised eyebrow. Well, a pinch of salt, I suppose, really. Agatha Christie, I'm a big fan of. I love her stuff. I think it's one of those things you can either read, watch, or listen to. Just disengage your brain, suspend your disbelief, get swept along by the story. And if you read her novels, she has a very, very clever writing style because it comes across as very brief and not a great deal of detail in it. But when you actually look back, she's dropping in little clues without you realising them. She's very like Terence Dix in that because she will do a brief sentence that completely encapsulates what she's trying to put across and gives you a lot of information in a very simple but clever way. Do we have a brief precy of what Murder at the Vicarage is about? No, and I'm deliberately not going to do that because it is one of the absolute classics of murder mystery. If you don't know what the plot is, if you don't know what the plot twists are, do yourself a favour and listen to this. I am not going to spoil it for you. I'm very glad you said that. I didn't know whether you'd want to do it or not. But no, with stuff like Agatha Christie, I've got the full box set of June Whitfield radio plays. Every iteration of Miss Marple is quite different. My favourite, unashamedly, is Joan Hicks. The BBC adaptations from the 80s and early 90s. I'm with you on that. Oh, yeah, she's, yeah. She's superb. This is not that Miss Marple. When they left the studio, uh, did you happen to notice what sort of expression they had on their faces? They were smiling and talking. They seemed very happy together. They didn't seem disturbed in any way. Oh, no, quite the opposite. Mm, deuced odd. There's something odd about the whole business. Why? Has Mrs. Prothero been saying that she committed the crime now? <laughs> How on earth did you come to guess that, Miss Marple? Oh, well, I rather thought it might happen. I think dear Lettuce thought so too. She's really a very sharp girl. So Anne Prothero says she killed her husband. Oh yes, she's quite insistent about it. Well, I do not think that it is true. In fact, I'm sure it isn't. Not with a woman like Anne Prothero. Although one can never be sure about anyone, can one? The Miss Marple in this is actually, she's quite close to how she is in the books. Slightly exacerbated by June Whitfield's performance, 
actually slightly unlikable. This... But that's the way the character starts off, and then she mellows. She um, does, but the John Hinton is... version is uh, its never quite this, even in the early one, she's never this unlikable. In this, she's very definitely the village busybody. and That is how she starts off in the, the novels. The unrealistic portrayal of, in this is actually the Joan Hickson one, because she starts off as the the lovely, fluffy Miss Marple from the later books. And that's not the way she was written in Murder at the Vicarage. Oh, no, it it's isn't. The, no. It's what she turns into. But actually, June Whitfield's portrayal is more in keeping with the original novel. I suppose there's no doubt about what she says. If Miss Marple says Anne Prothero had no pistol with her, you can take it for granted that's so. If there was the least possibility of such a thing, Miss Marple would have been onto it like a shot. <laughs> if you pardon the pun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true enough. Well, what's the next step? Uh, I'm going to follow up Miss Marple's suggestion and have a little talk with Redding and Mrs. Prothero. Yes. Well, Slack had better be in on it, too. And I'd like it to happen at the scene of the crime, if you have no objections, Vicar. It's like any of the Agatha Christie's, though. You look at the cast list, and I'll come on to the stars that are in it in a second, but the cast list reads like a... It's like the radio version of Cluedo, as several of the novels are across the various Agatha Christie ranges. You know, you've got um, the Doctor, Mr. This, Mr. That, a Reverend, a couple of colonels are in it, <laughs> so the police inspector. <laughs> That's where Cluedo got their inspiration from. But they are all very archetypal characters right from the off. But they're archetypal because they work. It's like the Sherlock Holmes novels. You can look at those and say, oh, that plot's terribly cliched. It's cliched because it's clever. It works. And because it works, it has been rewritten and rewritten and reused and reused since they originally did it. But the original Conan Doyles, the original Agatha Christie's, they were the ones that were coming up with these plots first time round. So twins and the mistimed death and the policeman investigating actually turning out to be the murderer. All of these were original plots when Conan Doyle and actually not just the two of them because Dorothy Sayers and Niall Marsh were there as well and they are contributing to the originality because at that point, murder mystery was very much in its infancy. What had there been before then? The occasional Wilkie Collins. I don't know enough about it. Strangely, for all that I, I love Victoriana, I'm not actually that fond of the scribblings because some of them are really, really turgid. So until you get into this period of novel writing, it's sort of a blind spot. Even stuff like Dickens. Oh, the Christmas but, um, Carol is great, but it is a turgid read Dickens. Baroness Auxey, the Lady Molly of Scotland Yard and the Old Man in the Corner Mysteries. Uh, has Lady Molly been adapted? Certainly the Old Man in the Corner Mysteries have been adapted for radio and they're very good and we can do those at some point. Well, in terms of an adaptation, as you would expect from any BBC production, it's beautifully produced. It draws you into this pastoral splendour of Mary Mead in the 1920s, sort of early 1930s, usually in the summertime, the cast, as they always are with stuff like this, is peppered with names that you would only expect to find gathered together for BBC. Imelda Staunton, Nigel Davenport, Richard Todd's in this, James Bree, Timothy Bateson. He pops up. He's Doctor... What's his name? Hey, Doc. No, he's the other Doctor. There's two Doctors in this. Can't remember. Uh, but Alice Arnold's in this. When, in her very early days when she was part of the BBC rep, she played Mary... She became a presenter in 1994, and she's now Claire Balding's spouse. So all these people are in this thing. There's barely a name among it that you've not seen somewhere else, particularly if you're a fan of radio. Uh, but getting back to the story, Marple herself, she sort of stumbles into this. Basically, coming for a nosy the morning after the murder. <laughs> Just invites herself into the vicarage and starts yeah, and poking around. And then when the, the vicar's called away to talk to the police, she sends him notes. Yeah. <laughs> it's proper, proper busybody stuff. If this happened now, you'd tell her to get fucked. But this is Agatha Christie. That did not go on in 1930. 
And she only really gets involved when somebody else mentions her as a witness and they go and interrogate her. And that's when she starts postulating all these theories, although she doesn't. She just sort of drops clues. Well, I know what's going on, you know, boys, but I'm not in a position to tell you I hate gossipers, you know. And it's only because somebody else mentioned her that she even gets involved in this properly at all. So she's a bit super fan. I know something, but I'm not going to tell you what I... (laughs) Mm, but where I do we know. know those from, Dr. Exton? But inexplicably, the police officers, in fact, everybody around her, starts telling her fine details, despite being named several times within the narrative as the biggest gossip in the village. Inspector Slack and Colonel Colonel Mustard, Colonel Melchett, they do the majority of the investigating. She spends most of the play badgering anyone that will listen that she suspects everybody of something. I think the biggest twist of the play is that Miss Marple is not the killer. <laughs> I do like it. It's two and a half hours that you're just drawn in, and what starts out as a very, very simple-sounding premise. Somebody gets murdered at a vicarage. You've got, what, half a dozen characters in Mary Mead that seem, if not directly involved, sort of closely involved as suspects. It sort of weaves out and weaves out until, in the end, you've got 20-odd characters involved, all of whom have their own backstories that are peeled away and is somehow they're all interconnected. What starts out as something very simple ends up as something really quite complex and interconnected. Yes, and when they come to adapt it for the television, I know that's not what we're talking about here, then the whole archaeologist Dr. Stone subplot of him being a thief and everything is just completely written out. Obviously, somebody turned around and said, well, actually, there's enough plot strands in this already. We don't need this extra one. I'd probably agree with that. Uh, Mm. It does start running away with itself to the point where, in the end, the story has got quite a long way away from the murder. And it's more focusing on all the private lives of everybody around than actually solving the murder. It's not a criticism. It was five half hours of beautifully crafted, beautifully acted, and beautifully written stuff. So you're not going to be disappointed whatever version of this you come to, whether it's the original book, the radio play, or the television adaptation. But I did, I was sort of... Slightly in awe. It's been a a few years since I've exposed myself to any Agatha Christie properly. And you always forget just how intricate they are. It's very easy to think of Agatha Christie stuff as simple. Fluff. Yes, fluff. There is a very good reason why they've stood the test of time. And I can't think of a bad one. Bertram's Hotel. The only thing I can remember about Bertram's Hotel is the TV adaptation and there's a woman gets out of the car without flashing her knickers and it's stuck in my head all these years later. The doors that open from the dashboard end and women that hold their knees together and swing their legs out of the car. And I remember watching that as a kid and thinking how stylish that looked. That's the only thing I can remember about Bertram's Hotel. It's the only one of the Miss Marple novels that really isn't terribly good, but thing about Miss Marple is that she didn't really turn up very much in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, when Agatha Christie was really going off the boil and you were getting things like Postern of Fate and The Third Girl and the ones where she'd lost her edge. Bertrand's Hotel was the penultimate one that she wrote. It was, That was published in sort of, I think, 66, 67, something like that. Nemesis came after that. Nemesis is quite a good storyline, but compared to the Poirot novels that really do tail off towards the end and the Tommy and Tuppence, because I think her last novel that she wrote, because there was a Miss Marple and a Poirot that were published posthumously. Oh, go on. Uh, Educate me. Which ones were they? The Poirot was Curtain and the Marple was Sleeping Murder. And she wrote those during the Second World War and had them put into her vault because she was worried that she might get killed during the the war. And she wanted her fans to have something to remember her by. And those two novels were kept until she died and then were published posthumously. So there was a classic 1940s Christie published after her death. Now, the thing about Curtain, and we're going off topic a little bit here, but the thing about Curtain is it's the only novel where you see the character of Poirot age. Both Poirot and Miss Marple, okay, they're, they're in their later years. He's retired. She's an elderly spinster. 
But they stay at that age throughout the whole of Agatha Christie's writing career, which spanned about 60 years or something. Whereas her other regular group, which was Tommy and Tuppence, started off as youngsters starting out their married life and then grow old as the books go on. So they get married and they have children and the children grow up and the children go away to war and they see their parents as a bit middle-aged and, well, they had their war last time around. It's our turn to look after them now, not realising that they're going off and doing spy stuff. And then in Agatha Christie's later years, Tommy and Tuppence are sort of elderly and retired and a bit old and infirm. And they kind of mirror Christie's age and life in that mm. they age with her in a way that Poirot and Miss Marple don't. The Poirot stuff, I never saw the most recent adaptations, and I certainly haven't read all the books. So I don't actually, I know he dies in the end, but I, spoilers. And, that, uh, and that's I, in Curtain. Yeah. It's the one that was published posthumously. And kudos to David Suchet, who he was insistent that he wanted to do the full canon. And I'm glad that he managed it. But Curtin, I think that it last. And he was looking it by then. So, And we is... can look at some of the, the BBC Radio Poirot adaptations, because they are excellent. Well, where that's concerned, there's John Moffat, of course, who really, yeah. really, I, I really enjoyed his. There's at least one with Peter Salis. It doesn't work. No, he makes a better smiley than he does Ed Poirot. Yeah, that really drew me out of it. Uh, it was it, halfway between. Was it the affair of the Christmas pudding? It might be one of the Christmas ones, actually. Uh, anyway, we're, we're getting anyway, we are, back we're, to Miss Marple. Back to Miss Marple. It's been years since I've come to these. In fact, this one, I'm not even sure I've even heard before. And as a result of listening to this, I've gone through, because you know what it's like when you buy a box set of things, they're not always in order. So I've gone through and ordered them. And I've got a real hankering now to listen to some more of these. The proper summer's afternoon listening at weekend with a pot of tea in the garden. Yeah, and it's proper autumn listening as well, isn't it? I've always thought of Marple as a summery. In fact, all Agatha Christie, they all seem to remind me of British summertime. And whether or not that's just my fake memory, but they're all very summery, with obviously with the exceptions of things like the, um, you know, Hercule Poirot's Christmas and things. But they all seem to be set in English sunny gardens. For me, it's quite nostalgic because my great auntie had a, it was a 1920s house and it was very Miss Marple and Agatha Christie. You could quite imagine one of the murder mystery dinner parties taking place in my great auntie's house. And it's one of those childhood memories where it always seems to be summer. Uh, whereas for me, they're kind of autumn and their night's starting to draw in. And you whereas, just want to well, sit down and, and watch something massively entertaining. Oh, you mean in terms of actually watching it, the sort of the yeah. time place element? Yeah. For me, it's the Sherlock Holmes stuff. Sherlock Holmes is very definitely a, a dark nights, cold nights, by the fire sort of thing. Sherlock Holmes to me doesn't really work watching or reading it or listening to it on a bright summer's day. It's a uh, Victorian London in the fog. Always, yeah. because Victorian London never had sunny days. They were always dark and in the fog. How far away have we got from Miss Marple here? <laughs> Fairly massively. Yes. Should we, uh, should we think about rating Rain this? <laughs> yes. How many earworms are we going to give this? This is the song that never ends. Yes, it goes on and on, my friends. So I'm going to give this a nine. I find this massively entertaining. It's a very good adaptation. It's an incredibly clever story, which we're not going to wreck for you. Every performance is absolute cut glass kind of literally in terms of the accent. I can listen to this over and over and over again. I'm a huge Agatha Christie fan. I think June Whitfield does a marvellous portrayal of Miss Marple and actually changes her portrayal as the books go on, which is, as much as I hate to say it, a criticism you can level against Joan Hickson because she goes steaming straight in with the Miss Marple of the later books, not the nastier Miss Marple of the earlier books. So, yeah, nine out of ten, I really enjoy this. I am forced to concur with all of that. Yeah, 9 out of 10. Apart from the fact that the source material is excellent, it's done by the BBC. This is not some audio company that have, have taken it and, and assembled a, a cast of their mates to do it. This is the BBC, and they always, always do things properly. The sound is beautiful. The sound design is beautiful. It completely envelops you in the Agatha Christie world. 
just absolutely sublime. BBC radio adaptations and radio plays, I am never, ever going to be hypercritical of, just because I think they're so well produced. And you can paper over an awful lot of cracks if something sounds amazing. Not that there's really anything to paper over here. Yep, I agree completely. So there's one final bit of housekeeping, and that is Podcast of the Week. What are we going to recommend? Right, well, what I'm going to recommend is a murder mystery drama podcast. And the wonderful people at Long Cat Media have done a slightly quirky, as you would expect from Long Cat Media, murder mystery set around a fairly tacky theme park in the 80s called Mockery Manor. It's really entertaining to listen to. It's very, very well produced and acted. It's a genuinely interesting murder mystery. Well worth having a listen to. I've not heard what they're like because I'm going to wait until it's all done and binge the entire lot. I shall check it out. I am actively trying to spend more time hunting down other podcasts, but you know what it's like when you're an edit monkey and chained to the desk by a cruel great provider. I don't, actually. (laughs) And on that note, boys and girls, I shall sign us off. We shall be back next month when we'll be reviewing the big finish Doctor Who story, The Secrets of Debt Sen. Until then, thanks for listening, everyone. See you soon. Bye now. The Archive of Audio Antiquities featured Simon Exton and Ken Moss. And the announcer was Jenny at Blue Box 99. All featured soundtracks are the property of their respective producers and no infringement of copyright is intended. Title music was by Edward White and the programme was produced by Maverick Productions. For more information, please visit maverickproductionsuk.blogspot.com or find us on social media.